The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day and welcome to 2015 in review, the big, tre big trends impacting 2016 webinar. Uh, in this, we're going to review the performance of Pharma in 2015, highlight some of the challenges companies are facing, and discuss how, um, or oh, how they might actually react to those uh, those challenges. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join today's webinar. Before we get started, I just want to review a few housekeeping items and then we can let you know how to participate in today's webinar. First, you should have a control panel on the right side of your screen. Towards the bottom of the control panel is the Q&A panel. You may submit questions or comments in writing using the Q&A panel during the presentation. All answers to your questions will be answered after the webinar by email. You may also comment live using the, uh, the Twitter hashtag script QS uh, handle. Uh, that's there on the, on the, on the screen and will appear on some of the other slides as well. So that's hashtag script QS. Today's webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive an email with a link to view a recording of today's event. My name is Mike Ward and I'm the Global Director of Content for Informa's Pharma Intelligence and Sites portfolio. That includes such iconic brands as Script Intelligence, the Pink Sheep and Invivo. I've been covering the pharmaceutical and biotech industries as a journalist and an analyst for more than three decades. And it will be my task for the next 45 minutes or so to moderate this panel. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to invite my fellow panelists to introduce themselves. So if we start with you, Tiana. Hello everyone, my name is Tiana Ignatovic and I'm the lead analyst for market access within Data Monitor Healthcare, the syndicated analytics business intelligence provider for the pharmaceutical industry. I have been covering the industry for uh, almost nine years and um, I oversee all the analysis relating to market access and strategic issues within the industry and that includes anything relating to pricing reimbursement, pay research, uh, pharma, uh, deal-making trends, R&D strategies, and generic ambassadors. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Lloyd. I'm the Senior Director for Pharma Projects and Data Integration for Sightline. So Pharma Projects is Sightline's uh, drug R&D pipeline intelligence offering. It's the original drug R&D pipeline database going all the way back to 1980. And I've actually been working on it myself since 1987. So I have almost 30 years of experience tracking drugs in R&D. The other sideline offerings you may be familiar with are Trial Trove, the database of trials, and Site Trove covering investigators and sites. I've also been the author of the um, Pharma R&D Review Report, which we've been producing, and I've been authoring that for about 20 years, and some of the data you'll see today will be based on this year's report. Great, thanks, Ian. Hello, everybody. I'm Jo Shorthouse, and I am the Features Editor on Script Intelligence. I've been covering the pharma industry and the clinical trials industry and the pharma outsourcing industry for the last eight years. Uh, it's my role on script to ensure that we publish original features that really answer the key questions and challenges that our readers may have. Um, this could be in the form of things such as videos or uh, infographics, written features or reports from some of our intelligence products such as Sightline, Data Monitor Healthcare, uh, BioMed Tracker or MidTrack. Um, as part of my job, I also publish the Script 100, which is our annual guide to the performance and prospects of the global pharmaceutical industry, and it includes the Script 100 league tables, which identifies and ranks the top 100 performers in terms of pharma sales. Great, thanks for very much, Joe. So, uh, as you can see, we've, we've brought together a panel uh, of experts who have been looking at this industry for a number of years, and it's a sort of the distillation of our thoughts that we're going to be presenting today. So five years ago, we ran a, a similar webinar, and at that time, the, the discussion focused on how the pharma industry was going to cope with the what was the looming patent cliff at the time. Uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars of drugs revenue were at risk as uh, blockbuster products approached patent expiry, and lucrative franchises were vulnerable to generic competition. Some of those responses included an increased focus on specialty and orphan medicines, greater reliance on biologicals, withdrawal from some therapeutic areas, and further consolidation and cost cutting. 
What has happened since then has been a mixed bag. While there's been some notable advances on the regulatory, scientific and capital market fronts, the top tier companies are still feeding the strain. In 2015, only three of the top 10 pharma companies actually saw drug sales increase year on year. In the past five years, total drug sales at top 10 pharma companies have more or less stagnated at some $340 billion. What we've got here are some of the recent headlines from our Insight products which show that the industry is not out of the woods. Red diseases are not necessarily the pot of gold that some companies might have hoped for, and more importantly, the price of new drugs is becoming a major issue for politicians. So indeed, at this year's JP Morgan healthcare meeting, which uh, takes place in January, the mood among delegates was gloomier than in recent years. The biggest dark cloud on the horizon is the fact that pricing and reimbursement is now a major issue in the U US presidential primaries. While well, farmers' reputation among patient advocacy groups has been improving in recent years, albeit from a low base five years ago, its image among the general public and politicians has been tarnished by some high profile instances of drug price increases that have attracted accusations of price gouging. The pricing and reimbursement issue is not going to go away, as, as we can tell by this, you know, some of the headlines uh, that were associated with the JP Morgan meeting. And we're not actually sure that the industry has actually even come to grips or really come to grips with, with this challenge. Listening to the top farm execs at JP Morgan, it was clear that some dismissed the challenge as isolated cases from rogue operators. And yet, as we've seen by the lackluster launch performances of the PCSK9 drugs, which were touted as potential blockbusters, failure to articulate a compelling value, uh, uh, value for money narrative has been very damaging. While in the past, pharma companies only need to worry about demonstrating safety and efficacy for their compounds, going forward, they will need to demonstrate genuine cost effectiveness and meaningful clinical outcomes. This is a new challenge which we will, you know, we will uh, have to sort of uh, deal with. Of course, the perennial problem for the industry has been R&D productivity. Are pharma companies able to develop new and exciting drugs? Ian, how, how is actually the industry doing on this front? Yeah, so on the left-hand graph, you can see the total number of drugs in the pipeline year by year. And by pipeline here, we're talking all the way from uh, preclinical development through the various phases of clinical trials, registration, and it also includes drugs which are launched but are still in development for further indications and for further markets. So you can see the headline figure from our report in January this year was 13,718. This actually represents a massive 11.5% year-on-year increase from the previous year, beating uh, the 8.8% we saw in, in the year before. So, so Ian, so what we're seeing here, that, that doesn't represent 14,000 new compounds. That's 14,000 different clinical trials. No, no, that's 14,000 different compounds or, really? or reformulations of existing compounds, but not generics. So these are therapeutic advances of one sort or another. Um, and in fact, I looked at the, the data uh, just before this meeting and the, the figure for today, because as I mentioned, this was produced for a report in January, has already gone up to 14,336. So it looks like the pace of increase uh, is, is, is accelerating, if anything. So, of course, you know, this could be uh, viewed as a good thing, more drugs in the pipeline. And if actually we break it down by phase, uh, we can see it's not just been brought around by a whole load of extra preclinical drugs. There are increases across all the different phases. Uh, drugs at the phase one stage of development increased by 11.4%, at phase two by 5.1%, and phase three by 18.1%. And this is really good for two reasons. First of all, phase three has been uh, the, the status at which uh, things have not been increasing so rapidly in recent years. It was fairly flat for a number of years. So to see this actually outpace the overall increase is really good. And secondly, of course, drugs, we need more drugs at the later stages of development because these will be the drugs which, which hit the market tomorrow. Yeah, and actually, how is this drug translating into new medicines? Are we seeing more new active substances getting um, approved? Well, the answer to that is yes, probably a bit. So if we look at the, uh, the number of new active substances, so, so new drugs and novel vaccines that were launched during 2015, we saw... 46, breaking down to 43 enemies and three vaccines. So this is pretty good, and it's kind of similar to what we saw in 2010 to 2013 
and in 2014 and probably if you draw a line of best fit then you can see an increase going up from around 2007. What it isn't as good as is 2014 where we saw a quite extraordinary year with 57 enemies and six vaccines. So people got terribly excited last this time last year that you know we're really breaking through some kind of sound barrier on this. Uh, in actual fact it looks as if 2014 was somewhat anomalous for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one was a whole a, a load of new drugs for hepatitis C which were all approved during that one year. So this represented really a paradigm shift in the way this disease was treated and really a whole new market opening for small molecule combination therapies. Probably the biggest change in the way a disease has been treated that we've seen since the introduction of heart for HIV in the mid 90s. Uh, and that wasn't followed up by a similar um, uh, number of new drugs um, in the year just gone. And the second reason was there was an unusually large amount of approvals in Japan brought about by regulatory changes in that market, which meant there was kind of a bit of a traffic jam of drugs waiting for approval, which all came through in 2014. So I don't think we can expect to see uh, a, a, the number of drugs approved each year hitting the 60s again. But if it still keeps climbing in, in, the, in the upper 40s, I think things are improving. It's clearly not accelerating at the same rate as the number of drugs in R&D. So at the moment, I think we're still in a situation where uh, increase in spend is outpacing increase in uh, money being recouped from launch drugs. Now, and, I mean, on, on this slide, you've also got the, the total number of R&D companies. So this is companies who have at least one molecule in, in, in a clinical trial? That's right, yeah. So you can see on the, the, the right-hand side, this again has been going up year by year. And going back to uh, 2001, you can see the number of drugs involved in R&D has tripled pretty much, which is, which is, I think, quite extraordinary. So the 3,687 you see uh, uh, companies involved in R&D, that's a 12.2% increase. That's, that's actually an even bigger increase in the number of drugs, which I think represents uh, a lot of uh, um, capital being out there for new companies coming along. Yeah, I, I guess the, sort of the fact that you know, access to capital for biotechs in, in recent years has actually been, uh, has been much easier um, and therefore prompted this increase in R&D companies. But we, we now suspect that actually capital formation is going to be slightly trickier. So you know, might we see a sort of a slowdown in, 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 the, in the increase? Yeah, and if we go to the next slide, we've got some information about some of the big companies and the small companies. So one of the things that I'd like to point out is that, you know, 56% of those 3,600 odd companies we saw earlier on are companies with just one or two drugs in their pipeline. So as you suggest, these are startups or, or very much niche companies, you know, the kind of companies that maybe are looking at orphan indications and, and maybe never going to be marketing drugs by themselves. They could be acquired or they could be seeking to license their drugs out to the big boys. So and how successful are those in terms of the attrition rates? The fact they've got one or two assets, because that sounds like it's a binary event for, for, for those companies. You know, if they, if they fail, their history. Yeah, well, I mean, this number's going up, again, extraordinarily year, year on year. But I think, as you say, if, if, the, if the money's starting to dry up, we might see this, this start to tail off. So it'll be really interesting to come back next year and see whether we've seen that for the first time, because it's one of those things where it goes up every year and it goes up by more every year. Or at least that's what we've seen in the past 10 to 15 years. Right. And the, so, the, so with the increase of number of companies engaged in clinical research, you know, the, the, the big guys, you know, what, what is their sort of share of voice, you know, overall? Yeah, so on the, the table in the left-hand side, you can see this year's uh, top 10 companies by the number of drugs they have in their pipelines. So you can see GlaxoSmithKline holding on to the top spot, but actually with slightly fewer drugs than it had at this time last year, and the same is true for Novartis. And actually, if we look at the top 25 companies as a whole, they now account for 14.8% of all drugs. And this is very, very slightly down. And again, year on year, we've seen this uh, figure come down very, very slightly. So what this indicates really is the top 25 companies starting to lose a little bit of share of the pie. And at the other end of the scale, we're seeing more and more of these smaller and niche new companies. Uh, we're also seeing the big companies narrow their therapeutic focus and go increasingly more for, for orphan diseases. Um, another interesting thing to point out is you know, we also look at where uh, companies are, are, are um, headquartered in terms of where R&D is occurring. 
what we saw last year was uh, a big increase in the number of companies headquartered in China. And actually, for the very first time, there are more companies uh, doing R&D, so not generics companies, R&D companies in China than any of the other Asian countries. So uh, Japan was previously the leader and South Korea was second. We expected China to overtake South Korea last year, but actually it went even further. So real indication that this is uh, an emerging power in R&D. And are they doing just clinical trials in China or, or do we still think that they're going to become global players? Well, a lot, a lot of Chinese companies now do have kind of US and European branches. So I think while it's true that a lot of that research is still just happening in China now, um, you'll see it uh, kind of uh, go out to, to other countries. But also, I think it's worth pointing out until a few years ago, you know, most of uh, uh, the farm industry in, in China wasn't doing original R&D on what you would call traditional Western drugs. You know, there was a lot, right. of, a lot of traditional stuff, but this is quite a new thing. Okay, so, so get, I mean, given the increased uh, you know, emphasis of all the diseases, you know, we, with these sort of the little biotechs, um, I mean, do you have any sort of visibility on whether these companies are actually progressing their, 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 their programs further in clinical development themselves and actually holding on to the assets uh, longer or you know are they having to sort of, uh, still create early uh, commercial partnerships and R&D partnerships? I think it's the latter. I mean most of these concerns are really far too small. I, I mentioned they have one or two drugs so that can be you know number of employees probably fewer than a hundred. There are certain companies that are covered on there which have one or two people you know, who've just taken some some IP uh, and are developing drug almost in the, the garden shed, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Joe, I mean, I guess there, there, there are no surprises here, but I mean, do you have some thoughts on you know how this sort of this lead table might uh, develop in, in in the coming years? Yeah, sure. Um, as part of our ongoing Script 100 data poll, um, we've got some data here that's yet to be published, actually, um, but in it we see that the R and D spend um, for these companies in 2015, it's still coming from the top 10 players. So there's really no, uh, there's no surprises in terms of the kind of companies that we see at the very top, at the top, uh, at the top 10. However, there is a change at the top. Um, on uh, on the data we see on the slide in 2014, we see that Roche is at number one. Um, in 2015, we see that Novartis um, moves from number three to the top spot, with Roche going down to number two, and uh, Pfizer is actually down to number three in terms of R&D spend. Um, we've got a, a little bit of slight shuffling in the middle of a pack um, with companies like GSK, Sanofi, AstraZeneca, J&J uh, &J and Merck slightly reordering themselves. Um, but the most interesting move to me is Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, it's moved from 10th position, as you see on the slide there, in 2014 um, to uh, number 7 um, in 2015. So that's quite a large jump for three places. Um, which is actually no surprise when you see that it's trying to narrow its therapeutic focus and it's making efforts in that field. Um, at the end of 2015, it sold its HIV portfolio to Viv Healthcare for 350 million, um, uh, and it's it's kind of opened itself up two of the um, the biggest therapeutic area, uh, sorry, two of the therapeutic areas that thinks it can make the biggest leap into is oncology and immuno oncology. Right, yeah, so I guess so, so some of the changes that we're going to see going forward is this, this big emphasis on immuno-oncology. Yeah. yeah, so before we look at immuno-oncology, let's take a look at the broader therapeutic areas. Um, so what you can see on the graph on the left-hand side is the kind of major therapeutic areas and the number of drugs um, in the pipeline for, for each. Um, we have 2015 in the, the kind of purpley colour and 2016 in the orangey colour. So you can see... Um, to kind of produce that 11.5% increase in the pipeline as a whole, there have been increases across all the, the different therapeutic areas, but the, the increases vary considerably. And cancer is not only the top one, it's also got one of the biggest increases. Uh, with uh, There's now one in three of all drugs in development uh, have at least one oncological indication. And this is one in five 20 years ago, so that's, that's a huge shift, I think. Um, some of the disease areas which are, which are losing share, so they have increases which are below the average, are CNS, which has really struggled to produce new drugs recently, uh, cardiovascular uh, and infectious diseases. And actually, if we break that data down by individual disease, you'll see 13 of the top 20 diseases are cancer. So 
The single most common disease for drugs to be developed against is breast cancer, followed by non-small cell lung cancer, then colorectal uh, and uh, pancreatic. Okay, so I mean, you mentioned about uh, sort of the, the rise of China. I mean, do, do we have any sort of visibility on where these trials are, are, are taking place? And, and is there any sort of, again, sort of shift in, in, in the balance of power? Yeah, it's not. The data is not shown here, but we do. We do have a breakdown by by uh, the the, the uh, territories that drugs are being de developed in, and we'll see the U.S. is by by far the the the, the, the biggest one, it's accounting for about half of all companies. There's some there's some slight in, uh, changes, but not really hugely significant. So although we've seen more companies in China, the amount of drug development taking place there as a percentage of it globally it hasn't really changed very much, although it's creeping up. Right, okay. And, and this explosion uh, in, in cancer trials that, that, that we're seeing, you know, is, is this around sort of the excitement associated with sort of the advances in the you know, immuno-oncology space? Yeah, so first of all, on, on the right-hand side, you can see um, uh, the, the, the breakdown between biotech and non-biotech drugs. Uh, and then now moving on to look at immuno-oncology. So obviously immuno-oncology is kind of the hottest of the hot area areas at the moment. And you can see here why Joe was pointing out Bristol Myers Squibb's big increase in R&D. You can see it's by far the, the biggest uh, um, uh, particip participator or sponsor of immune oncology trials. And you can see that also it's covering a wide number of different diseases broken down there by the different colors in the bar. And also to give you a sense of how immune oncology is exploding, uh, the, the graph on the right hand side shows the number of deals that we've been reporting between companies developing immuno-oncology drugs. So it was pretty flat in 2011, 2012, 2013, and leapt up in 2014 and in 2015. And there are now actually over 400 different agents which could be called immuno-oncology drugs in the pipeline. Right, yeah. so, so I mean, given the fact that there, there, there is this increase in, in developing combinations associated with immuno-oncology, can, can we assume that this number is actually going to continue to grow as you know, the leading companies are, the people who are trading by uh, uh, Bristol Myers, look to find companion assets that they would actually want to uh, test in tandem with their, their, their own lead programs. Absolutely, yeah. A lot of these trials are, are combination trials, and uh, at the moment we, we don't see any evidence of this slowing down. In fact, the rate of acceleration is increasing at the moment, and you know, pharma companies do tend to behave somewhat packed like I think and uh, this is certainly the way that, that everyone's rushing at the moment. Right okay I'd just like to, 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 to remind the audience that uh, you know you can comment live uh, using the the hashtag script QS um, uh, Twitter uh, hashtag. So I mean this is all very exciting um, but given the cost of some of these new treatments you know, are we in danger of making healthcare unsustainable? Tell me. Yeah sure so if you look at uh, oncology drug management, traditionally in the US, it's been tightly managed in the sense that most insurers have prioritization requirements in place in order for, for the patients to access these drugs. But if you actually look at those the criteria that are used in the prioritizations, they are not really restricting prescribers' choice. They are within the FDA label, and also the, requ the legal requirements cover uh, use uh, covered within compendia means that uh, lots of oncologists can actually prescribe these drugs off-label as long as the use has some evidence behind it. And when we speak to payers, uh, clearly they are frustrated with the rising costs. Oncology uh, drug spend increase is really at top of their mind, uh, not just because the prices are high, but because they're used for longer, with longer survival, uh, and also there is the issue of financial toxicity for the patients through the out-of-pocket costs. But they feel the hands are tied. Uh, they have to cover whichever cancer drug gets the FDA label. And the only way that they can really foresee any change is if there is KRL support for it. So if the physicians and the KRL supported, then maybe possibly these uh, you know, access could be a bit more restricted in the future. Uh, but before that happens, I think one of the interesting developments in 2015 is that in the US, we've had uh, three uh, different drug value frameworks being um, launched for oncology drugs specifically. First is the ASCO value framework, then the NCCN evidence blocks uh, that have come out for several indications, and also Memorial, Memorial Sloan Catherine's Cancer Center. Um, they, they uh, together with uh, real endpoints, produce the drug advocacy tool, which calculates the drug uh, 
price uh, relative to the value it brings to the treatment. So all of a sudden we have these independent organizations which are looking at the outcomes that these drugs bring and you know bringing in the price into the equation as well. So looking at this value, you know, what, what is the outcome you get for this price? And if we see, what, this one scenario we can see playing out is that the physicians and the care start to reference these value-based frameworks, they're not you know, perfect at the moment, but as they evolve, they may become you know, a bigger influencer in how the physicians choose their drugs and, and also the payers will start mm -hmm. referencing in the future. So how are pharmaceutical companies um, sort of dealing in this new ecosystem? So I think what's really important is understanding how are these uh, key uh, frameworks uh, and tools working, how are they setting these drugs, and, and being able to provide the evidence that maximizes their drugs' chances of being rated highly. Uh, so it's really down to the evidence base. And if, if you look at some other broad healthcare initiatives that are also likely to impact oncology in more in the near term, uh, we can look at uh, oncology pathways, the comfortable care organizations, and bank payments. And then they also sort of converge back to this issue of what's the evidence base. Uh, in specifically, oncology pathways. These are uh, clinical care pathways developed by physicians working with third party organizations that are very much evidence driven. They tend to uh, look at the evidence that's available for drugs. Uh, you know, what's the, the efficacy, then what's the safety for drug, and finally what's the price. And they, uh, some of the, these tools actually, they, they rate the drugs based on the evidence base they have in a particular patient subpopulation. And we are increasingly seeing some of the large insurance carriers uh, contracting with these uh, third party providers or using their tools to contract with the providers to say, okay, if we select these high performance drugs and rate them as on pathway, we will be incentivized financially to stick to on pathway drugs for a certain percentage of the patients. And effectively, that means that some drugs will gain higher market share if they're rated higher by these uh, or as the best treatment within the oncology pathways. Uh, it doesn't mean that their effect will be negative. If the drug has the best evidence base, it actually boosts its use. So, so, so how does this translate to uh, pricing pressures in the US then? So uh, essentially, I mean, it just comes back to this uh, growing cost of, of treating uh, oncology. But I think what's so been dominating the news uh, a bit more, and you, know, you may say they're outliers, but they certainly have uh, brought uh, the focus on pricing, it has been the case of excessive drug price hikes. You know, we've seen uh, the two-inch trial case dominate the headlines and getting the legislators' uh, attention. And you, know, you, you may be asking, you know, is a new drug uh, price regulation on the horizon? Certainly the Democratic candidates have come out with their own uh, price control bills. But you know, in reality, the, you know, if you have a Democratic president, will they actually introduce a, a drug price legislation? On their own, they can't do that. And uh, you know, not, they can't really do it without support from the Senate and the Congress. And we think that the other legislators will be more focused on the, on the healthcare reform act. But what it does bring to, into the public eye is this pressure on price, is the visibility of it, and what we see is increasingly the public support. And I think that's a much bigger risk. If the public support for drug price regulation continues to increase the way it has up to now, then this really brings a real risk. So either the industry sort of has to start to self-regulate, so to speak, on how they price the drugs, or this is, you know, may happen. You know, had you asked us this five years ago, we would have said, no way. But now we're not as sure of that. Um, so in terms of what's going to happen in the meantime, before you know, potentially any legislation comes out, well, the drug value frameworks are going to have more and more influence, and we've discussed those, and, and also the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, they've started to publish their assessments, and you know, the payers may not uh, reference these officially, but they will certainly look at them and say, okay, if the ISA is saying that this drug is overpriced by 50%, this is going to play a role in their contracting negotiation. So the company, the industry really needs to pay attention for what evidence also these independent frameworks are requiring. And you know, one of the sort of uh, also important events from 2015 that I think we need to pay attention to in 2016 are the outcome-based reimbursement deals. They've been fairly rare in the US in the past, uh, but we've had clearly the PCSK9 deal uh, 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 Amgen and, and Harvard Pilgrim, and we've now recently had Marathon Trust. So, and uh, you know, I think that all points 
to the, the fact that they will not be as rare as they were before. Uh, clearly, there's appetite both on the industry side and on the payer side to engage more in them. But in terms of will they become more common, like very common in the face contracting, we don't think so. I mean, these are quite uh, high administrative burden deals. Um, Surely the small uh, insurers are unlikely to want to go for them unless they have a particularly good infrastructure and, and links between their claims and also electronic medical reference data. But it would be interesting to see how how actually insurance and the, and the industry also uh, experiment with these deals. You know, they're just a bit more inexperienced with them in the US. Um, uh, how, how do you define a hospitalization that's uh, linked clearly to heart failure? How do you sort of uh, remove those ambiguities? Uh, I think this will be an interesting thing to see how things play out. Uh, and also, you know, will the industry and the US payers also apply some of the learnings from European experience? In Europe, we've had the risk sharing deals uh, for longer. Um, there have been some successes and some failures. And you know, we've seen lots of them in oncology. We don't see that in the US there. Uh, you know, we wonder, are we going to see any convergence also in terms of how long these deals go for? We, got, we expect to see experimentation in the US. Right, I mean, and, and does it mean that, uh, you know, companies who've actually, you know, traditionally had more exposure to European markets so are going to get some, you know, potential uh, advantage going forward? Uh, Potentially, because clearly if they've been uh, used to uh, providing a very strong evidence base and also health economics and outcomes uh, data to the European payers, you know, they may end up identifying those pair archetypes that they can expect the US payers to behave more like in the future. They definitely see convergence between Europe uh, and the US in terms of uh, reimbursement. Um, and, and, you know, Europe has not been, um, uh, has been accustomed to cost containment for a longer period of time. And if you look at some of the events from the last couple of years, clearly that trend is continuing. Um, in the UK, one of the key events has been the reform uh, of the Cancer Drug Fund. That's going to happen or come into effect this year. And Cancer Drugs Fund has really been a sticking plaster for oncology market access in the UK for a number of years now. And that's had to change uh, under the current proposal uh, or decision is going to become a managed access fund with clear entry and exit criteria and what that really means that some of the drugs that are covered under it will likely be delisted and in the future uh, the drugs that will get covered by the uh, cancer drug funds will be those that the NICE has said no to but not just because there's a price is too high but because there is an uncertainty in the evidence base and maybe it's not quite clear what the survival uh, rates are because of the crossover clinical uh, trial design, and, and you know, I don't think that's going to just put extra pressure on the pricing in the UK, and we've clearly seen a uh, lot of negative reactions through the industry around that. If you look at France, France has generally been quite uh, much, much more generous uh, in reimbursement compared to the UK, uh, but since 2013 there is a requirement for the drugs that have added benefit level of three or higher to undergo economic evaluation. And there's been a big question when that was launched, you know, is this going to become French nice? And that has not happened, but clearly these evaluations do impact into the price negotiation with SEPs. And just underline really this appetite for, for the, the health economic data that is growing in, in, in all the markets, really. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm just sort of thinking, so, so with, the, with these uh, evaluations, I mean, are we, are we sort of seeing sort of changes in the way that companies are devising their clinical trials so that in fact they're not just looking at against placebo but actually having to now do more comparative trials with uh, you know to get this you know our our compound our drug is better than the, than the, than the competitor uh, we certainly see uh that lots of companies are paying more attention to what endpoints are used and that the endpoints are not just the ones that the clinicians will want to see but also that the payers will want to see you know so one of the examples is, is the uh, interleukin 5 inhibitors in asthma, such as uh, Nicola and the other L5s, and they all uh, have this um, impact not just on anticipations but also on hospitalizations. And clearly, this is uh, pretty much you know, hospitalizations and ER visits is the number one endpoint for payers. So, we do see progress. It's not to say that there's still not oncology trials that have wrong comparators in it, and I think you know this, this is clearly not seen very positively by, by clinicians or the payers. Um, if you look at some other some, uh, key events to look out for in 2016, I'd really like to pick out Germany. Um, we've 
you know, Amnon um, Law has been dominating the German headlines since 2011 and really impacted the pricing in the country. But there are signs that potentially could be reformed this year. And one of the major changes will be the change to this mixed price uh, that they're calculating um, <coughs> under Amnon and the benefit assessment, if we can do GBS, set drug benefits in, in multiple subpopulations. And then the final price is negotiated depending on what added benefit they have in what subpopulations. And we have on occasion seen drugs that have a wider EMA label than they really have evidence based for, which sort of inevitably leads to um, no added benefit in some uh, patient populations. And in Germany, insurance are obliged to reimburse within that core label, which ends up impacting the mixed price. If you move away from this mixed price calculation, we can see potentially higher prices achieved in narrow narrow uh, uh, patient populations, but then the insurance will be able to restrict access uh, to those patient populations. And, and another sort of, uh, potentially big change is, is the uh, possibility of wider contracting for preferred agents within passenger drugs as well. And in 2015, there was a new law that was passed, the Act to Strengthen Provision in the Statutory Health Insurance System, and this law had really paved the way for the insurers to find alternative methods to the current indicated prescribing limits to um, encourage economic prescribing. And the pilot in Bavaria has really shown that what they do is, is essentially open up tenders where they have contracted agents and then their incentives for the physicians to prescribe those contracted agents. And, and we see this, you know, if further sickness funds follow suit, this would impact those drug classes where you have multiple drugs with little differentiation competing really for these contracts. And taken as a whole, you know, this potential Germany change and also changes in other countries really mean that there is a clear need to incorporate the reality of the global pricing and reimbursement environment in the forecasting, business development and licensing decisions. And what we sometimes hear from our clients in market access functions is that when they get consulted for these, their, their voice is not quite heard. There is still that expectation that a higher price can be achieved and by the reimbursement. And we really don't think that that's any longer the case. So, so companies are actually struggling to sort of cope with some of the potential changes that they have to address some of, some, some of those issues that you're, you're suggesting. Yes, and you know, keeping an eye on what the changes are in the environment and also making sure that you know, all the different uh, functions within the company are, are tied together and, and communicating effectively. Right, yeah, thanks. So, I mean, if, if we sort of think about, say, going back to the sort of the webinar that we ran five years ago, <laughs> At that time, there was, as I said, there was concern about patent claim. So the, the, so the market access issues were more of a European experience at that time. You know, NICE was the one that everybody was talking about. Um, but you know, pipelines were, 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 were not being replenished. There was a, a potential what R&D um, uh, deficiency uh, or deficit uh, within the department. And M&A was, in fact, the, the, the quick fix. Uh, in particular, companies acquiring sort of specialty armor assets. Um, Joe, I, how is that sort of shaped up? Well, I think uh, as a journalist, I, I often think about things in headlines. And if I had to think of a headline for 2015 M&A, it would really be that Big Pharma is back. Um, uh, until up until 2015, it really um, had taken a bit of a back seat. Um, because we've had things like the patent clip, as you mentioned, and absorbing some rather large transactions. So we've really seen it be specialty farmers' party, um, it really uh, since about 2012, actually. And um, specialty farmer entered 2015 really, really strongly. Uh, we saw companies like Activist, we saw Valium Pharmaceuticals, uh, Endo Pharmaceuticals all make large transactions earlier in the year. Um, but really, really dropped off in the second half of 2012, uh, as we saw that its debt levels reached, uh, as, a, as a peer group, its debt levels reached more than 34%, which, uh, just to give some kind of um, idea of uh, concept, that's about three times as much as the rest of the industry. Um, and so its ability to conduct these tools really, uh, really diminished, and we saw Big Pharma obviously take over. I think the, um, if we're thinking of specialty pharma, uh, the poster child for this was probably Valiant, 
um, we we described them on a deal making frenzy within Script, um, and it's really really been on this this frenzy deal making for, for several years before it ran into its own trouble um, with its drug pricing and private scandals that uh, everyone's seen those headlines about. Um, and its stock price actually dropped more than 60% over the last year, so we can see that confidence has is, is, is also been affected. Um, Ernst & Young, uh, every year, they publish a firepower index, um, and one of the authors on that noted that at one point during the year, Valium was so over-leveraged that its debt of $32 billion exceeded its market cap of $30 billion. So we can just kind of see the kind of figures that we're talking about there. Um, so we did see some record-breaking M&A activity. Um, we're going to talk about the Pfizer-Algan deal uh, in, in a second, so I'm not going to talk about that one right now. Um, but as I said, the, the patent cliff really did dominate the big farm story for the last five years. Um, but now we have seen this peer set, this big farm peer set, slightly return to growth, as you alluded to uh, at the beginning. Uh, we saw some really big deals from companies like again, Pfizer. Um, Pfizer um, acquired Hospira for $17 billion. Um, and Abby bought Pharmacyclics for $20 billion, and then Merck bought Cubist for $9.5 billion. So these are really, really huge figures. Um, but it's, new, it's not just big pharma that's been on, uh, on the hunt for, for, for deals. Vita have also put their money to work in some really big multi-billion dollar deals. Um, we saw Alexian um, pay $8.4 billion for Synergiva. Uh, Celgene or Receptos, Amgen uh, committed $1.25 billion for Dezima. So we're seeing some really, really huge figures from both both sides of the slide to compliance. And, and in a lot of cases, so these are where you can sort of see that, for example, you know, the pharmacyclics acquisition mm. or the cubist acquisition, it was where Big Pharma was really putting some firepower into certain franchises, whether that be Hep C mm. or antibiotics, etc. Yes, um, there's that narrowing of therapeutic focus again that we're seeing, as, as Ian was talking about earlier on. But, but and Hospira, one again, can sort of see what it was doing for Pfizer. Mm. But the deal with Allergan, okay, yes. is, is, is a kind of game changer. And I, and I just wondered whether you, know, you could sort of you know, give us some thoughts on, you know, is there really an appetite amongst pharma executives or, or executives at these top pharma companies for this real mega merger M&A activity? Or is... <laughs> is this Pfizer Allergan deal, a real sort of you know, black swan phenomenon that you know we know it's going to turn up. Mm -hmm. We weren't surprised it's going to turn up, but it's still going to be very rare. Um, we're going to. Um, uh, I'll talk about some of the um, some of the uh, thoughts from the pharma um, industry um, uh, a little bit later on. But I think uh, one of the main things that we've heard from some of the people that we've been talking to is they're, they're more interested in things like asset swapping. Again, I, I hate to hammer at home the point, but it's this therapeutic focus narrowing. Um, so I think, I mean, I don't think we'll see another deal like Pfizer Allergan for an awfully long time. I think it was the, the top ever healthcare deal um, in terms of amount, and I think the third largest deal ever made globally in, a, in, in the corporate environment. But if we talk about the Pfizer Allergan deal, um, uh, obviously it's 160 billion, everybody's seen the headlines. Um, and it really kind of uh, dwarfs the, uh, the first three quarters of 2015 um, was 151 billion um, in M&A deals. Obviously, the, the, the last quarter of that just blew everything else out of the water. Um, so, you know, is, is it a win-win for, uh, for both sides, Pfizer and Allergan? Um, well, it, with Pfizer, it, it, it beat its own record. <laughs> it bought um, Warner Lambert for 90 billion in 2000. Um, and obviously for Pfizer, we all know that um, tax is, is a huge part to play in this. Um, it's now going to be domiciled in Ireland, and by 2017, it's going to pay about 18% in court tax compared to 25% that it pays at the moment in the US. Yeah. So, so I mean, so if if we look at that, you know, this idea of, sort of tax inversion, mm. I mean, when, when Pfizer attempted to acquire AstraZeneca, like sort of the year before last, uh, you know, we right our farmer intelligence and our farmer insight teams. I mean, we, we were among the first to actually question the, the business rationale for them to even try and do that, mm -hmm. beyond tax saving. Mm -hmm. um, and we correctly forecast at the time that you know, the likely failure of that proposal. Is there anything in this deal beyond you know, that you know, uh, more attractive tax rate that actually should have us thinking about the Pfizer-Oligan deal as, as, as being a good one? 
Um, the re scripts reporting on it's been fairly neutral. We, we haven't really come out on, the, on, on either side of the deal. Um, I think one of the interesting kind of ripples that's come out of this is when we've been talking to some of the more active patient groups and they've been saying to us that perhaps their, um, their confidence in companies such as Allergan perhaps has dipped slightly because they always worry when they, when they see these big corporate deals done for tax reasons, it's also all about the you know, from a patient's point of view, it's all about the tax and the money. What about R&D? What about our, our, our drugs that, you know, you're, you're, you're supposed to be developing? So that's one of the really interesting side things that we've been uh, keeping an eye on. Um, obviously, for Allergan, it's got huge um, it's got huge implications. Um, it's now going to get 70 additional markets for, for its products. Um, but one of the one of the, um, the side issues, one of the ripples, um, is looking at the shop called Brent Saunders, who is, what the CEO of Allegan is now president of Pfizer. Um, he's shown himself to be a really, really shrewd deal maker and somebody that um, has made wonderful headlines for us um, over on the insights side of things. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of, of the kind of deals that he's made since he's been at the top of this, uh, uh, this field, he's overseen about 152 billion in acquisitions and major divestitures between two, uh, 2013 and 2015. So that's just two years. Um, uh, he's done things like he sold Bausch and Long to Valiant for 8.7 billion, and, and, uh, and Forrest to Activist for 28 billion, and then a CEO of Activist, who then bought Allegan for 66 billion, um, and then of course uh, sold the company's generics business to Teva for 40 billion. So he's a really, really interesting character. Um, uh, is he the next CEO of Pfizer? I'm not sure. Um, perhaps uh, Ian Reid has something to say about that. I know he's, uh, he's, he's in his 60s now, is Ian Reid, but. Um, uh, you never know if, if, if these personalities are going to align with the, um, uh, the company strategy. Um, they both have a very similar acquisitive strategy. Um, obviously, Reed oversaw the 68 billion buyout of Wyeth in 2009. Um, there has been um, slight anxiety amongst some of the people that we've uh, that, we, that, we, uh, that we talked to as part of our kind of daily reporting that um, perhaps Saunders isn't as committed to all stages of R&D as as far as uh, traditionally has been. Um, uh, however, Script interviewed Saunders about three weeks before the Pfizer merger came out, and he absolutely reflected Pfizer's strategy of investing in early stage in-house research, and was very, very keen to make us aware of that, and we reported on that. Um, so if we're thinking about um, tax conversion, which Irish companies should we look at, or should we keep an eye on to be uh, acquisition targets? Um, there are a couple that spring to mind, and um, there's a cardiovascular company called Amarin um, uh, that's based in Dublin, as is a orphan drug company called Horizon, so we'll be keeping an eye on those two companies. But if we have a look at uh, the wider industry, so outside of Big Pharma, we also have a CRO based there called Icon. Um, you know, are we looking at perhaps a situation uh, in the next couple of years where um, a large CRO, uh, an even bigger CRO than Icon, such as Quintiles, um, maybe would come in? Uh, and buy some of the icon, or maybe even with a large farmer, come and buy icon as its R and D on, and then can uh, domicile itself in Ireland that way. So that's just something that we're um, that we're keeping on as well. Yeah, and of course, I, it's interesting though you sort of talk about the, the commitment of fire to R and D, mm. um, because of course you know they were they were one of the companies that actually has seen you know between 2014 and 2015, you know, sort of 700 million drop yeah. in their R and D commitment. So mm. that's a, Probably about ten percent. Mm. So you know, so one one would get some questions to you know, the mothership yeah. own commitment to 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 research and development. Mm. And I seem to recall that was one of the issues about AstraZeneca or the AstraZeneca acquisition in terms of you know, did they have the appetite to, to have that? So yeah. So to come back to 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 to, to, to my question. Um, okay. So we know that you know Brent Saunders has been a very very um, active kind of guy. Yeah. Um, and we've seen some of the other sort of specialty pharma guys, but with the, with the with the pharma guys, mm. it actually looks like they're they're shedding assets. So it comes out the question: Do these guys really have that kind of appetite for for for, for M and A? Um, well, certainly already in 2016, we've seen um, Shire and Bexalta finalise their deal for 32 billion, um, which makes it the largest rare diseases company. So we're seeing that speciality side of it come through again. Um, 
but uh, if we look at some of the uh, stories and some of the people that Scripps has been talking to and reporting on, um, especially at conferences like the JPM conference, we can um, we can report back to our readers on um, really kind of straight from the horse's mouth exactly what they what they think. Um, I was at Novartis' uh, results day back in January, um, and Joe Jimenez stood on stage and said, you know, um, and I quote, "We're in charge of our own destiny." Uh, we're not going to be doing any really big deals. Other companies think they have to substitute for a small pipeline, but not Novartis, so we can kind of rule them out. Um, but then we also have companies such as Sanofi um, at JPM, Olivia Brandeport um, told us that it'll be rebuilding its oncology pipeline through M&A, so that's, that's um, a company that's got the appetite for M&A in 2016. Um, and Jane j and said they have the cash and the appetite for M&A, so that's two good things to, to, to um, that, that, uh, that make a good M&A deal. Um, but then we have a company such as GSK, um, uh, their chief strategy officer, chap called David Redburn, he told us that um, it's going to sit out of the M&A scrum, um, that they're really just going to focus on um, uh, the essence swap, the, uh, the transaction that they did from the Vartis. Um, where they've got this much better balanced portfolio so they can really focus on vaccines, consumer health, respiratory and HIV medicines. Um, so we've got kind of two very different uh, opinions and, 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 and strategies towards that in 2016. Um, are we going to see more mega mergers in 2016? Well, I don't think we're ever going to see anything as, as big as the pfizer Argan deal. Um, but certainly if, if valuations continue to come down and debt's still inexpensive, I don't see why not that could trigger some activity. Um, uh, I think, like I said before, I think it's going to be more asset swaps, maybe reverse mergers or divestitures rather than mega, actual proper mega mergers. Um, uh, and uh, as I said, we're kind of we're seeing these therapeutic battlefields, um, companies trying to gather their balanced portfolios together so that they have exactly what they want going uh, forward. Uh, and I guess that the fact that the capital markets for in recent years were really, really supportive of biotech, biotech companies could actually, uh, you know, basically stuff the coffers full of cash to sort of mm. develop as, 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 as much as they wanted to. Now that, that that money is getting, you know, more tight mm. uh, to get, I guess that they are, again, sort of potentially, the exit for, for investors in these biotech companies or the ability to, to develop might, again, you know, the balance part might rest back with, with, with Big Pharma. Mm. I mean, it's... I mean, have you guys got any sort of you know, thoughts on that? Um, I think that um, uh, some people, that, some analysts that we've been talking to have said to kind of expect another 200 billion year. So uh, M&A um, deal making is going to be the same level as 2015, if not higher. I mean, obviously we have the external headwinds. Um, we've got to think about um, the TR alluded to with pricing pressures and, um, and some macroeconomic conditions. Uh, of course, we've got things like uh, generic threats and biosimilars coming in. So there's so much to look at in 2016. I think M&A is going to be um, very, very interesting to keep an eye on, definitely. Yeah, I mean, and on the biosimilars front, I think we we do pretend to have another looming patent cliff mm -hmm. where, in fact, some of these, these the, the biologics, although, again, we, we, we've seen some of the, you know, the, the CEO of Abbey saying, oh, we're not worried about Humira. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, what, $14 billion? Um, you know, and nothing when to worry about. Nothing, yeah, <laughs> so, so, so some revenue should only to, to to worry about. Mm. Okay, so um, so as as we as we sort of go forward, I mean the the the, the list of top top pharmaceutical companies actually hasn't really changed. I think Gilead Sciences is the only company that has kind of like merged into you know taken a position in the top ten. Yeah. Uh, in in in, in recent years. In our recent script, 100 Gilead went um, uh, from number 21 to number 9, um, based on 2014 pharma sales. Um, its pharma sales actually rose by 130%, um, which is just generous. It's, and that was what? That was, they they, raised, they went up that much, is that between 2014 and 2015? Yeah, sorry, that's between 2013 and 2014. Yeah, because yeah. I, think, I think that we've, we've seen another big, big step up. I'm really interested to see the... Um, uh, with, with Gilead, so yeah. I think Gilead's going to be probably even you know, higher up. Mm. Does that mean that actually we might see the big biotechs all of a sudden start to... I mean, we've seen some deals with the likes of Amgen, etc. But can we actually see big biotechs actually starting to become big players in, in, in M&A activity. Mm. I think so. I think definitely it's definitely something that we're going to be keeping an eye on. Um, 
and we'll be interviewing all the, the top strategists um, within biotech so we'll be able to to bring the latest strategic thinking to the readers right okay so i mean the, the, the fascinating thing about this, this industry is that there's plenty of things going on and mm -hmm. there's obviously plenty of things for us to to to, to report on and to and to, to analyze um uh, i mean this has been a, a you know a fascinating discussion um uh, thank you very much. I, I, I'd like to uh, thank the audience uh, for, for joining us today. If you've got any you know, further questions or, or comments, please email them to uh, pharma at informa.com. Um, as I say, you can also you know, make comments on, on Twitter at the hashtag script uh, big Q, little s, uh, so script QS. Um, and it just leads me to, to thank my fellow panelists. For, for, for their contribution to this webinar and yeah thank everybody for for again listening and have a great rest of the day thank you